A picture is worth a thousand words. It's an age-old saying that still holds true today. After all, a picture lasts forever and gives insight into a different time. Historians trace the invention of this medium back to the 1800s, when a French photographer was able to create the first permanent photograph. Since then, billions of photos have been snapped, capturing key moments and people throughout history. Take, for example, the U.S. Civil Rights Movement. During the 1950s and 60s, the country was deeply divided by racial inequalities. Tensions were high and violence ran rampant. However, if you weren't there to see the action with your own eyes, it could be difficult to grasp exactly what was happening and how much it mattered. I know that there was apathy, there was indifference, especially when you get beyond the South and you get into the North because things were so different. When Black folks share what's actually happening in their lives, typically we're not believed. So prior to that, there was indifference. And, and Dr. King wanted to say, he used the term creative tension. He wanted to create tension that would force people to have to do something with it. That's Philip Allen, an activist and the author of the book, The Prophetic Lens, The Camera and Black Moral Agency from MLK to Darnella Frazier. Allen says that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. wanted to break through people's indifference on achieving racial equality and ending segregation. For some Americans, these issues didn't directly affect their daily lives. Many stayed on the sidelines, worrying that risking their safety was not worth someone else's fight. He knew that people needed to see. And what actually sparked the movement was the photos of Emmett Till. So you could say the same thing was happening within the Black community. The photos of Emmett Till is what kind of sparked him in his casket, his body unrecognizable in the casket. That sparked the movement itself. But then it was the images throughout the movement that just wore on the conscience of the country, and one could also argue the globe. So I think prior to the Civil Rights Movement, it was apathy, indifference. It wasn't touching people's lives. And Dr. King knew that that needed to change. Civil rights leaders knew that that needed to change. Many historians point to the lynching of 14-year-old Emmett Till in 1955 as a catalyst for the emerging civil rights movement. Till, a Chicago native, was visiting relatives in Mississippi and was murdered after he was accused of harassing a young white woman. He was abducted by two white men, brutally beaten, and then shot in the head. His lifeless body was then thrown into a nearby river. When Emmett Till's mutilated body returned to Chicago, his mother chose to have an open casket so everyone could see what had happened to her son. 50,000 Chicagoans showed up and saw Till's disfigured, swollen corpse in person. Hundreds of thousands more saw him plastered on magazines and newspapers across the country. She didn't want her son's death to be in vain. As an adult, she was fully aware, unlike Emmett Till, of what was happening in the South, the history, the violence, the injustice, what have you. And I think she didn't want her son's death to be in vain. Something, some good, some change had to come from this rather than just accepting his death. And so I think she made the hard decision. And it was almost like, I'm going to force America to see what they did to my son. And it worked. This widely circulated image sparked national outrage and banded Americans together in support of the civil rights movement. Allen says that activists during this period relied heavily on photography and video for multiple reasons. Dr. King would cancel events if there weren't going to be white mob violence there. If he'd found out that there was not going to be any resistance to their sit-ins, their demonstration, their direct action. He would cancel the event. He would also cancel the events if there were going to be no cameras out there. Because the cameras, not only do they tell a narrative, this narrative to the world, they were also a means of protection. Because if the cameras were there, even though there was still violence, it would also keep some white folks from doing more. Allen recalls one instance when a white activist was the target of an angry mob. He was holding equipment that looked like a camera, but in fact wasn't. However, he pretended that it was a camera and pointed it towards the onslaught of people headed towards him. He said, go ahead, 
I'm paraphrasing a bit, but he was saying, go ahead. The world will see what you're going to do. And it, it actually stopped and turned away. So the camera for the civil rights movement for Dr. King was not just to tell a narrative, but it was also to protect the people from the violence, from even more violence. But sometimes it doesn't end this way. Too often, the camera merely captures the violence that's unfolding in front of it. Allen points to the death of George Floyd in Minneapolis in 2020. There were several bystanders recording the incident and pleading with officers to stop what they were doing. But despite this, George Floyd was still murdered in broad daylight. Allen notes that the cameras in this incident showed two entirely different perspectives. There was video from the officers' body cameras and then videos shot by nearby bystanders. One of these witnesses was Darnella Frazier, a Minneapolis teenager who filmed the entire incident using her smartphone. She then uploaded the full video to social media. My response to her video was very different than my response to the surveillance video. The distance from the event makes a difference. So when I saw Derek Chauvin's eyes, it took me back 20 years to when I was profiled and pulled over in my neighborhood and his eyes, Derek Chauvin's eyes, reminded me of the police officer's eyes. I wouldn't have gotten that from the body cam footage necessarily. I wouldn't have gotten that from the surveillance footage across the street. But from Darnella Frazier's vantage point, I could hear George Floyd speaking, crying out to his mom. So I think whoever has the possession of the camera, the angle, the perspective, can tell a different narrative. Allen emphasizes that photography is power. Whether it's a still picture or a video, an image can sometimes say more than words ever could. I now have the capacity to not only record and hold accountable, but publish. And I don't have to wait for a TV network to do it. I don't have to wait for someone to give me permission to or give me the resources to. We all have access to both. Most of us have access to the camera and social media to publish. And we can connect through social media with so many different people, celebrities, politicians, news stations, what have you. So there's power there. So it calls for us to be responsible with that power, but also proactive to be activists with that power. To find out more about this topic and our guest, Philip Allen, visit viewpointsradio.org. Also check out his book, The Prophetic Lens, available online and in select bookstores. This segment was written and produced by Amira Zaveri, studio production by Jason Dickey. I'm Marty Peterson. Coming up next week. Keeping it clean, keeping it simple, just the facts. What is it that a smart professional would need to know about what's happening in the world today? We've heard of snackable social media content. What about snackable journalism? Then... Kids are curious, so it's just natural inclination to just, oh, let me just Google this word I heard that I don't even know what it means or something silly with my friend. The tips your kids should know when getting a cell phone. I'm Marty Peterson. And I'm Gary Price. These stories in depth on your public affairs magazine, Viewpoints. And that's Viewpoints for this week. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram to learn more about upcoming shows and find a library of past programs on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and Spotify. Plus, you'll always find previous segments and more information about our guests at viewpointsradio.org. Join us again next week for another edition of Viewpoints. Viewpoints.